Hi, this is Sir Lorkin, and I uh, wanted to make a video today to discuss the ideas of commitment and advantage in uh, SCA fighting specifically. A lot of this stuff is universal to any type of fighting that has rules. Um, I may be assisted by my corgi, Daisy, if she comes back out, but uh, don't worry, she is trained enough to not cause too much trouble. Um, I'll be using this uh, demonstrator here uh, when I'm working through techniques. The white edge is my true edge and lined with my, in line with my knuckles, that's my front edge. The blue edge will be the back edge in line with my thumb, that's where I'll strike wraps and such. Uh, this red tape here is going to remind me what part of the blade that I want to strike with for the maximum uh, effect. Um, any questions on any of this, please reach out to me, comment, etc. Um, first advantage. Um, in the SCA, we are specifically supposed to be doing chivalric combat. Honor and courtesy are supposed to exist on our field, particularly the tournament field. But even on the war field, we don't, for instance, strike someone from behind. It is considered unchivalrous and unfair, not to mention unsafe. This does shape our game. So some people will question, mm, how do we feel about it, taking advantage of things? And to me, this comes down to fair and unfair advantages. And you can look at this your own way. But when I look at it, if I step out on the field and I can throw a better flat snap than my opponent. Um, that's a fair advantage. I have put in the effort. I have earned that with sweat equity, if you like, with work. Um, if I'm taller than my opponent, it's kind of an ambiguous advantage, really. It doesn't hurt me uh, for the most part, but I've had my butt kicked by people who are substantially shorter than I am. That's uh, an advantage that is what we might call a natural advantage or an inherent advantage that is a long way from absolute. Um, then there are advantages uh, like, let's say, a mirror-polished shield face that you use to shine the sun in your opponent's eyes. That's actually illegal under our rules because that's considered an unchivalrous advantage. Um, some of this really is down to your personal attitudes and ethics, but our rules are mostly based on the idea that we're trying to preserve a sort of fair contest where the person who understands more, knows more, has practiced more, can come out on top. That said, like I said, there are what I consider fair advantages. If uh, my opponent does not have very good footwork, and I can control them by changing angles and putting pressure on them. That gives me a distinct advantage. That's the sort of advantage that'll win you fights. And it is not considered in any way dishonorable or unfair. So this is what I'm trying to address when I say advantage in this context. Uh, I hope that that is sufficiently clear. Again, if you have more questions, yeah. Uh, next, commitment. Um, lots of jokes could be made here about how men are afraid of commitment, but a good fighter for really almost any fighting discipline you can imagine, from boxing to jousting to you name it, um, has to be aware of the commitment of the body. If I am here, my knees bent, spine upright, my weapon in a relaxed position on my shoulder, I have very little commitment to anything in the sense we're talking about right now. Whereas, if I shift my weight onto my front foot and take about a half step forward, I have a lot more commitment. I've committed more of my weight to this foot. Now, if I want to change, I've got to put a lot more effort into it. Come back here. I can move in any direction pretty comfortably, pretty easily, without a lot of 
setup or shifting weight around or anything. If I want to go that way, I just go. A little push off with that leg. Um, my weight is flexible. It's floating. It can go just about anywhere. Whereas if I'm here, now I have a much easier time going straight forward and back because of the lean. And really the easiest movement I have is forward. All I need to do is just kind of bend that knee and I'll go forward. Whereas if I want to go backward, I've got to push, I've got to lift and move that weight. If I want to go to either side, ideally I've got to actually recenter my weight a little bit so that now I can move. I can try take a step with my back foot. You can do it, but it's it's slower, it's more awkward, it's less steady. Um, if I see a charge coming on the war field, and I go, okay, I've got to receive this charge, I might shift to a more committed forward stance to help absorb that impact. I'm getting lower, and I'm shifting them forward to absorb the charge. That is a commitment that makes sense for me there. It doesn't, in my mind, make a lot of sense to make that same commitment if I'm in a single combat with an opponent who is in a balanced stance, who hasn't made a commitment that gives me a need to do that yet. Where this gets really interesting is in thinking about the strategy of your fight. Uh, my approach, and this fits in with a lot of medieval uh, fight teachers' approaches, although it can be phrased a bunch of different ways, is to try to limit my commitment to what I need to gain an advantage. I don't want to commit without it creating an advantage for me. And if my opponent commits, I want to understand, I want to see it right away and I want to understand it because normally speaking, if your opponent makes a commitment, there is a way that you can turn that to your advantage. So again, if I see that my opponent has taken a stance where they've shifted their weight to their front foot, they're down low, um, like they're either ready to receive a charge or to, uh, to receive one, I've got some options there. One thing I could do is I could try to bait them into charging. Taking that thing that they've already got some commitment to and following through on it. Because when they go forward, they're not going to have an easy time doing anything else. So for instance, if I were facing the camera as my opponent, if I was able to think and get them to go, ah, here he comes, I'm going to charge him. If that charge comes forward, and I can roll offline and hit him in the back, that works for me. I made a minimal commitment to try to convince them that I was making more of a commitment and that they should commit, go all in on that idea that they had for what they were gonna do. And then, because I haven't committed fully, I can change. I can say, ah, okay, that's what I wanted. Here it comes. That's the idea here. It's essentially the chess game side of the sword fight. Um, there really are two fights going on here, uh, for the most part. There's the um, sweat and muscle side, and then there's the chess game. The sweat and muscle side is necessary pretty much all the time, but the chess game is what sets apart the truly great fighters. I'm not there yet, I'm working on it, but I'm not there yet. But I see it happen up and down from the newest fighter to the very best. You can see different ideas behind what you're doing and why. Generally speaking, the better the fighter, the better that they can decide when their commitment is going to go, why it's going to go, what it's going to get them. Um, So let's take an old school setup and delivery 
here as an example. I'm going to turn around with my pal. So you look from my shield side at this one. My typical guard facing my opponent looks much like this. But I'm going to face my opponent here. If I'm here, just at the end of range, I could throw a good thrust, but I'd take a little bit of move forward to actually land a good blow at the edge. Um, if I'm here and I want to hit my opponent in the head, See, I've got to lean a little bit. Um, that lean's a commitment. If I lean, and it doesn't work, let's say they block, now I've committed forward in a way where it's tricky for me to change that. Really, the easiest thing you can do from here is step forward to recover. If for some reason that looks like a bad idea, like there's a thrust coming at my face or something like that, if I need to move another way, from here, uh, that's going to be relatively slow and relatively awkward. Relatively a big word here. I'm not saying you can't do it. Far from it. I'm saying you can't necessarily do it as quickly, as smoothly, as easily as you want. That is giving your opponent advantage. You don't want to give your opponent that. You want to make them work hard for every advantage that you can while you take more advantages than you give them. So let's say that from here, I'm just out of range, instead I take a sliding step. This is a very small commitment, but it still gets me exactly where I want, where I'm landing that red part of the sword right in their temple. Bam. So two different forms of commitment, much more committed, much less committed, still gets me what I want. The shorter you are, the more you're going to have to do to close range, because your steps aren't going to be as long. That's not necessarily bad. More longer steps tend to mean more commitments. If I'm out here, I can close this in one step. I've got long leg. But I'm actually, for the most part, better off doing it with multiple smaller steps, because I commit less because, for one thing, I'm telling my opponent less of my intentions by making those multiple smaller moves. If I let my opponent know, here it comes, that's a commitment that has given them advantage. So now they know he's coming down the middle. Um, and if they know it, they can figure out what to do about it and use it against me. If, on the other hand, I can step here, to here, I could change direction easily at any point. I could be going. Very flexible, very smooth. I'm giving my opponent much less to work with. I'm keeping for myself the advantage of being less, uh, less predictable. But now, let's say that However I got here, but being in a good stance, with my shield up guarding, I've thrown this shot at the temple, and it hasn't worked. It's blocked with shield. Bang. Boot. At this point, I can disengage because I have not committed much. That's a really good option. You really want to be able to bail on a plan. Doesn't mean you should bail on the plan all the time, but you really want to be able to. You can gain a lot of information that way from how they block, what they do. If they block in a way you really didn't expect, for instance, let's say in that case, you expected them to block with a shield, and instead they blocked with a sword and were setting up a repose that you didn't see coming. Bail! Makes sense. If you've made enough of a commitment to go for the shot, you're here. Bam. The other option is to commit further to create.
create advantage. So in this case, what I'm going to do is I'm going to commit forward motion. And I'm going to commit in the body motion, throw here, so that I can hit him in the ribs. What this looks like, if it's all going nice and smoothly, is But the truth is usually a little jerkier than that. And the jerkier it is, less successful. Um, and this is why relaxation and flexibility become really important when we're talking about commitment and the advantages it can give or take away. If you are relaxed and flexible and move smoothly, tensing up where you need to to deliver power to move uh, suddenly, but otherwise staying relatively relaxed and loose, not slack, but loose, able to move easily, flexibly, and smoothly, you will be harder to read. Your opponent won't be able to gain the advantage of saying, aha, I see where he's going. I see where he's tense. I see where he's off balance. I know what to do. And that's a big advantage you can keep for yourself. Thank you, Scratching the board. If I haven't decided yet for sure, how I want to approach my opponent, what I want to give them to start with. I can, with very little commitment, I can test them. Start up. Making those small movements in and out, and not just straight in and out, but in and out, in and out, circling, changing angle, seeing what they do. Very little commitment in that, so it's very low risk. I'm probably moving, I expect that I'm moving into my opponent's striking range, but I'm staying at the edge of it where they don't have as many different ways to threaten me. Because again, if I'm far enough away that I can land that, I'm not even close enough to land that. I don't have a lot of options. I can't really land a wrap very well from here, maybe just at the tip, but it's probably going to skip off. Um, most of the body blows, they're not really going to land. So at the edge of range, what we sometimes would call C range, there are threats, but they're not as many viable threats without further movement of the feet. If you can stay out of range, out of measure, to just in measure, you can probe your opponent's uh, offense and defense. You can figure out what they are likely to do. You can see if they overcommit, give you an opening, give you an advantage. Or you can see that they don't. You figure out, okay, I'm going to have to make a bigger commitment to gain an advantage here. That's really valuable information. If you've got an opponent who is cool and collected, watches you with their guard up, and just goes, mm, no big deal, maybe makes a little shift here, little shift. Just, just what's necessary to shut you down, no more. Okay, minimal commitment is not necessarily gonna crack that nut. You've gotta, you're gonna have to give more. But this is part of how you figure that out. You could also just go with hell-bent for leather, just straight down the middle from, from lay on. And that's an option. It's an option that's much riskier. If you win, it looks awesome. If you lose, it tends to be over very quickly, just a smack. Um, and ultimately, it relies more than I would like to on luck. It relies less on skill. It's great to be lucky. But you want to be able to win even when luck's against you. You want to be able to take victory through skill and determination. And so that's why we practice this stuff. If I'm facing my opponent 
and my sword is here, my hand is relaxed, I haven't committed a whole lot. That said, a different commitment picture compared to if I'm here. If I'm here, man, that comes off really fast. If I'm here, it's a little slower. It works, but it is a little slower. Um, likewise, you know, if somebody's here in what we call an A-frame, sometimes with the shield up and the sword down, a little more challenging to throw a wrap from here. You can do it, most certainly, but it's not as easy to throw as it is from a shoulder position. So when you are evaluating your personal commitments and your opponent's commitments, this is one of the things you can look for. Where is the sword? Another is the shield. Now I'll just grab the buckler because it's easier to see around. If somebody's got their center grip here, well, that's not much of a movement. They probably think you're not a threat where you are. You probably think that we're out of range of the fight. If somebody keeps their shield there when you're in range, you should kill them. Or at least double kill. But let's say somebody's got the edge of their shield up against their head. This is effectively a commitment of their defense with the shield to this quarter. This quarter is open. Now, they may be waiting for you to throw there, hitch in the arm or something like that. Doesn't mean that it's yours for the taking. It just means it's open. And this is part of the picture of their commitment. So you look at, okay, this is covering this quarter. It doesn't mean you can't hit there either. It just means, for instance, that if you can convince them that you're going for this leg by throwing a good downward snap to the leg, without committing all the range to it that you possibly could, make it a real shot, make it a feint where it's going to hit if they don't do anything, but don't go all the way into it. Shoot for it, make them believe it because it's real, and then if they have to dump their shield from here down to here and throw for that arm, if you can snap and step aside and throw at the head that is now wide open, hey, that's great. You're using enough commitment to get them to move without so much commitment that their plan works for them. I hope this makes sense. Sounds great up here. Um, As you study your opponent and how they block, you'll see patterns. If you throw a flat snap and they block it, flat snap, and they block it the same way, maybe you throw snap, wrap. And this and this are going to look really similar if you have good technique as the techniques start. And if you can get them to commit to the same block, before they fully see what's happening, while you're working on their anticipation, you're getting to go, oh, okay, I got it, I got it, I got it, bang! I didn't got it, what up? Um, this is you working their commitment, getting them to commit where you want them to. Um, I'm a big fan of this approach, because if I can get my opponent to do some of the work for me and make a commitment, then I can make my necessary commitment with much more safety. Now that's perfect. To know t if I wanted safety, I shouldn't be putting armor and going out on the field, but still much safer. Uh, we were talking about the leg shot to open an opponent's defense and their shield is high. This shot is a meaningful commitment. One of the reasons why is if I'm low enough to reach here, I'm well inside range for a whole bunch of shots. And that means that my opponent could be throwing any of those. But another factor is time. This shot takes a while. 
also, reason why good fighters tend not to begin uh, an assault with a wrap. Wraps are a bit slow compared to thrusts or front edge shots. Doesn't matter whether you're doing it right or not, the time it takes to throw this shot is just more time than it takes to throw this shot. All else being equal. And the time it takes to do this is time that your opponent could be using. Say, I see he's committed to coming in, and there his ah his his arm is going a little wide, it's not coming straight in. I see what's happening. And if you have committed fully to the shot, you you are predictable for just a just a little while there, just enough for them to take you down and a great antidote to a wrap shot coming in from this opponent's shoulder is just straight down on the shoulder. Great. You see it coming. Oh, it's the wrap. You shift a little to cover the wrap better. And land it. When you see the commitment, you know there's going to be vulnerability there. Because it doesn't matter how big my shield is. If I'm throwing the wrap, some of that's open. And you just have to aim your shot just past the edge of the shield. Even if it doesn't take their arm or hit them in the shoulder or anything, it's still going to foul their blow. It's still going to take their, their commitment and ruin what they hoped to get from it. So now they're committed, they're extended, and they have not succeeded and there you have an advantage. And that's your opportunity to exploit that advantage, to turn that into something else. Let's say that, yes, I've struck down and I've, uh, I've hit the shield, but I've tabled it, you know. I haven't struck my opponent yet, but I've managed to take their shot on my shield, foil them. Now, I've got an advantage because I'm not extended all the way out here into a wrap. I've got a blow that is faster and easier to recover. One of many ways that could go. I could ramble on about this for a lot more hours, I'm sure. But I think I'll stop there for today. And again, Please let me know if there's something else you'd like to see me go through or more questions you have on the subject. Thank you.